following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Thank you, Telly Olson. We are back talking ball and life in the zone. I've got a terrific panel. George Case III is here. Hello, George. Hi there, everybody. David Hubler is here. Hello, David. Hello. Hello, hello. Uh, how are you? Um, Hal Bach is here. Hi, everybody. Welcome back, Hal Bach. Um, We were just jokingly talking off the air that I asked everybody if they're healthy, and they said, yes, we're healthy, Um, but we're all day-to-day, one of us quipped. It's not all that funny, but uh, at any age, we're all day-to-day. And I thought that's what we talk about, injuries in careers. What Pick a ball player, any sport, who started out with all the potential in the world and whose injuries really ruined them. Um, Sure, I've got one. I've got one. Tony Canigliaro. Sure. Talk, Talk about him, if you would. Well, uh, he was he was a, as heralded a player in Boston as they've had since the days of Ted Williams. Uh, he could hit, he could field, he could run. He was a heck of a ball player. And then he got hit in the face by a pitch from, I think it was Jack Fisher. Hit him in the eye, almost took out his eye. And he obviously was sidelined for quite some time. He tried to make a comeback. But he just was not the same player, and he died prematurely. He died young. Uh, but he had the potential to be a superstar. He had some very good numbers uh, until he got hurt, and I think that affected Fisher uh, terribly. As uh, He was an effective pitcher until that moment, and then he went downhill as well. And you can imagine why that would happen. I mean, that's a dramatic episode. Uh, and for a pitcher to, to be responsible for a guy going down that way, uh, I can see where it would have an emotional effect on him. So Jack Fisher suffered, uh, he didn't die, but he suffered uh, dramatically from the same episode. But I remember Sports Illustrated, I think it was, had a picture of Canigliaro, and his eye was completely closed and black and blue and just an ugly, ugly picture of a guy who suffered a, just a traumatic, horrible injury. And he wasn't the same after that. Well, you, you know how taking that a battery in the opposite direction, the same could be said for Herb Score. You're right. Uh, you know, when he was hit, I think it was Gil McDougal who hit him. Exactly, uh, with a, you're right. Uh, and uh, he was never the same. Um, he did wind up as as a, a play-by-play announcer uh, for the Indians. I remember seeing him coming into the stadium there in Cleveland uh, one time and getting ready to go up into the booth. Uh, and I think McDougal, too, suffered from it. Uh, maybe not to the same extent publicly, because uh, McDougal was sort of a quieter guy, I think. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's just the same kind of – just ruined his career scores. Your memories are very accurate. Gil McDougal retired shortly after that. Yeah. All yeah. the intensity – um, left him. So, and I don't think he's been back for any of the Yankee old old timers day. If I'm not well, mistaken. he's no longer with us. He's uh, yeah. Well, McDougal yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. passed away, but but he actually um, he was the baseball coach at Fordham for many years. That's correct. Yeah. And he had gone deaf, and really required a you know hearing aid and all that kind of stuff. But I remember when uh, the, the episode happened with Score. And McDougal was so upset at the time, he said, you know, he was going to retire if, if Herb Score wasn't able to, you know, regain his sight. Because mm, mm. it was just a horrible injury. Yeah. Now, oh. Score, came, Score came back, but, you know, he was never as effective as he was when he, when he you know, before the injury. And the fact is that, that Score, you know, claimed it was really nothing uh, from the injury. Although, I think, personally, and I was, I pitched you know, when you get a comebacker like that, you remember it, especially if you get hurt like that. And I think he changed his motion and and that kind of thing, and it certainly hurt his arm. 
and, and, you know, it was a horrible injury, and it affected both players. And like you're talking about, how with uh, with Canigliaro, I remember that episode very well myself. As a matter of fact, somebody sent me a book uh, about that episode uh, with with Canigliaro, and and part of it was his remembering, you know, how awful it was to have that ball hit him in the face, and he, he and you're right, he almost lost his eye. Yeah, I'll throw out another name, Pete Reeser. Good one. Absolutely. Yeah. Now I don't know too many of the details of what curtailed his career, but he was a sure shot, you know, Hall of Famer coming up. Well, he he was a contemporary of my dad. You know, Reeser was playing with Brooklyn in the National Brooklyn, League. Right. My dad was in the American League, but but Reeser's problem, you know, he was injured so often because he ran into walls. That's what he did. I mean, he was so aggressive. You know, he would try to catch a fly ball, and, uh, you know, this was long before, you know, the outfields were padded and that kind of thing. And he had some severe injuries as a result of, uh, you know, his, his uh, running into walls. Another another one I'm going to throw out, and, and you guys may remember, is uh, Mickey Cochran. Uh, Mickey Cochran was uh, probably one of the greatest catchers of all time, uh, was playing for the Philadelphia A's with those great A's teams. And and he was beamed and almost died. I think he was in the hospital intensive care for a certain uh, few days uh, and never played after that. He became a very, you know, a very good manager with the Detroit Tigers. But the fact that Cochran, uh, his his injury getting hit in the head, and this was before there were anything like batting helmets. You know, the players went up there yeah. with just their – their baseball cap on, and uh, you know, if somebody came inside and the ball, the pitch got away from him, and the batters were going to take it. And and that injury to Cochran was was another horrific uh, baseball injury that shortened the career. Yeah. Uh, I want to get back Mantle? to Reeser for just a second. Oh, okay. Do you think of him running into walls and getting concussions? You think two or three times he was carried off the field. Like twenty one times wow. in his career. I didn't know that. He was just unabashed. Um it was pre warning tracks, but he uh for some reason uh, had a pension for literally running into the wall with his head. And DeRocher said when he came up that uh he was the greatest ball player he'd ever seen. This was before Willie, um, but so but injuries really killed him. That was was it. This was just uh, after the war, wasn't it, or during? The, I forget. It's I know he I, played in the forties. Yeah, it was the late. It was the late forties, I think, David. With, yeah, uh, with, yeah. With, mm-hmm. And that, his nickname was Pistol Pete. It was Pistol Pete Reeser, and uh, he was very fast. He was very, you know, a very, very good ball player. Like Ralph is saying, you know, with DeRozier said he was one of the best he ever saw, and, and certainly, you know, the injuries uh, curtailed his uh, his effectiveness as a major league ball player. That's for certain. Yeah, well, Bryce Harper suffered the same thing in his first year with the Nats. He got hurt a number of times running into the walls, and they really thought that was going to hurt him a great deal in his playing career, but suppo- supposedly he was able to, to recover. But, yeah, he hit, he hit the walls a lot, even with the warning tracks. Right. Now, hi, guys. I'm sorry I liked. Yeah, Al Blumkin, welcome yeah. to the Airwaves. We have George Case with us today. Al Bach is with us. And David Hubler is with us. What yeah, I apologize for my life. the same booth I've assembled. I'm very proud of you guys. Uh, we talk ball on a weekly basis. Today, Al, we're talking about players who have been injured, players with great potential who have suffered injuries and or sicknesses that uh, curtailed their career. We covered Reeser. Um, Chris Gall, and we covered the the pitchers and the batters that injured those two players, Jack Fisher and Gil McDougal, and how they were affected their career. Jack Fisher. 
uh, what I how mentioned that uh, it was Jack Fisher who he was hit Tony Liero. Tony Liero. No, it's Jack Hamilton. His name was. Oh, okay. Jack Hamilton. It wasn't Fat Jack Fisher. No, Fat Jack oh, Fisher okay. was twenty-four games in the Mets one season. Right. Well, that that was Craig Anderson, but that's yeah, and the Herb <laughs> score. Yeah. But other than Not that, right. we're all right. You, you mentioned Herb right. score. You, you mentioned could always count on the Mets for for setting records for uh, losing a lot of games. But um, no. so I'm going to ask Al Blumkin, what it doesn't have to be baseball. What athlete comes to mind under that um, that criteria for you? Well, I'll tell you one of, one of the saddest cases. Uh, you know, uh, you're all old enough to remember this. Was Harry Aganis, yes. who was in all, uh, at Boston University, was all American, everything, football, baseball, whatever, and he uh, signed a big contract with the Red Sox. Was there in 1954. All of a sudden, he came down with. Uh, Pneumonia in May of 1955, and died in the hospital. He's 25. Wow. Yeah, Aganis was a great player. Again, I, I'm I'm very much uh, aware of him. Uh, yeah. He, he was the super talent, Alan. You're, you're right, and he was a great athlete. I think he played at least three sports, and uh, you know, and he, he his career was, was uh, you know on the ascend. And all of a sudden, he did. He came down with that illness, and uh, and that was it. He he passed away very quickly. Yeah, that was you know, uh, I was I was around 12 years old when that happened. You know, that was the first uh, uh, you know sign that, that these guys were mortal. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good point. Right. Wasn't he called the Golden Greek? Yeah. Yeah. Harry. Now, who was the player who was shot in a hotel room? That was oh, Eddie Wakefield. Wait. Yeah. Eddie Wakefield. Yeah. He didn't uh, die uh, from that. It, it, you know, he recovered. But uh, there was a book that came out, a number of, uh, a biography of him that came out several years ago. That said basically uh, he never recovered uh, fully from his World War II experiences. Uh, yeah, you know, you know, I've heard Alan, Alan, yeah. and, and Hal, and, and Ralph, and, and David. I've heard that that the you know the film The Natural was loosely based on Eddie Wakeus. Yeah, the book had yeah, it. I heard that the film was yeah. loosely based on it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Bernard uh, Malamud, right? Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. yes. And, One of those uh, where the film was equal to the book. Yeah. Uh, according to the bio. Uh, I think it's called Baseball is Natural or something like this you can probably find it on uh, Amazon somewhere uh, that uh, he uh, after his playing days were over he started uh, hitting the source a lot huh. and uh, that's, what, that's what eventually killed him uh, too bad I'd heard that about you mentioned Mickey Cochran before George Right. I heard that about him too yeah, I'm I'm not sure, Ralph. I I don't know all the details, but you know, he 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 was uh you know, obviously he's in the Hall of Fame, but and we were going to talk a little bit about the Hall of Fame, I think, but Mickey Cochran was uh, a a key player on those uh, Philadelphia A's teams at that 29 to 31 era which uh they won two World Series and three American League championships and they had four future Hall of Famers in in Fox, Cochran, Lefty Grove, and Al Simmons, you know, playing for another Hall of Famer and, and Connie Mack. So, you know, Mickey Cochran was right in there. And uh, then, you know, Connie Mack had to start to sell off those players to pay his Great Depression bills. So, you know, he I think he sold uh, Cochran for like, uh, you know, $150,000 or something like that. So, I mean, Mickey Cochran was a great catcher, uh, certainly one of the very best of all time, along with, you know, Bill Dickey and Campanella and, and Ben Chen. Yeah, he, be- yeah, you know, he became great, great player. So uh, he became player manager of the Tigers. Yes, he did. And uh, yes, he did. He, you know, won a pennant in 1950, excuse me, 1934, and a World Series in 1935. And then uh, 
he got he was still playing in 1937 where he got hit in the head with a pitch ball from a pitcher named Bump Hadley, and uh, it almost killed him. Right. And uh, that was the end of his playing career. And uh, since he wasn't effective as a manager without playing, you know, it, it just spiraled. And uh, uh, I think Ty Cobb uh, helped pay for uh, Cochran's uh, funeral. Yeah. Well, you know, Alan, I, I had mentioned Cochran and the injury, you know, before yeah. you came on, because the fact is that that during that era there were players they were hit in the head. Oh yeah. And it was it was horrible if you got hit in the head because you had absolutely no protection. No, there were no batting helmets, there were no liners, there were no anything. And and Cochran was an example because he got beamed. Yeah, and, well, uh, you, you know, you the, the other part of that, even going back even 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 further, was the Carl Mays and and uh, you know that situation. Ray Chapman, yeah. With Ray Chapman, when yeah. he yes. was actually killed, uh, died a day or two after being beaned in the 1920s, I believe, and and that's uh, you know part of what baseball was like back then. There yeah. was very little protection for the hitters. Well, you can credit Branch Rickey, the great Branch Rickey, came up with the idea of putting liners inside the baseball cap. That was the first protection they got, and that was about 1950 right. when he was with Pittsburgh. And that grew from there to helmets to now we have the face guards because of uh, uh, Giancarlo Stanton getting hit in the face a couple of years ago. Um, they added now they've, they've almost every player wears a face guard to uh, protect their face <clears throat> because uh, that happens, you know. Well, yeah. did you see when Not Luke... Not necessarily uh, intentionally, I mean... Ball, the yeah. ball gets away sometimes, you know. Right. Uh, what's his name on the on the Nats? Luke. Um, he got hit, just grazed his face, but it looked awful on the screen um, when he went down uh, for a pitch ball. They thought he was going to be out for weeks, but he was back the next day because it just grazed his cheek and and lips. But boy, did that look awful on television. Now, now, if you throw, you hit. Hit a batter inside. There's a full-scale riot. Yeah. yeah. Well, they do. I mean, uh, the the old-time pitchers they would they would come inside, and you know that was accepted. And and some of the players, you know, they'd say, "Hey, if if I'm going to go down, I know I'm going to go down." This guy, but they're they're prepared for it. But sometimes the pitch gets away, and, and that's what the real danger I think is. And so, like you're talking about now, Hal, with and when I was playing back in the fifties. I remember putting a liner inside my my baseball hat. That was the first, and uh, you know, then they went to you know the helmets, and then they went to helmets with the ear flaps, and the, and now they're with the chins and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, they're they're trying to protect the hitters, but uh, it was uh, you know it was a scary time if if you were a hitter, especially at the major league level, because there were some pitchers they were going to come inside, and uh, you know some of the players were affected if they got knocked down. Uh, they they get up and they're a little bit leery. Other players, uh, I think it was Clemente and Mays and those guys, you know, they weren't affected. They they expected it, but they didn't really go down because the pitchers knew it wasn't going to impact them. But some guys get very gun shy, and so if a pitcher knows that or a catcher knows that, they'll come inside and knock them down. And and sometimes you know they're going to say, hey, the plate belongs to me. You're going to dig in on me. I'm going to put you on the on the seat of your pants. Yeah. Early win. They own the inside <laughs> of the plate. The really great pitchers have to establish that fear. Yeah, early, right. early win didn't didn't back yeah, down. Early win was a, a prime <laughs> example of that. Yeah. You know, oh yeah. Did, absolutely. Yeah. You know. <laughs> he said something about he'd knock his mother down if she could hit. <laughs> well, yeah. He he knocked his mother down, and he <laughs> and he actually did knock his son Joe, Joe Early, who I knew. Joe and I played uh, as kids together. Uh, you know, his son, Joe Early, got up and hit a few shots off his father, and his father put him down on the ground and said, you know, I just <laughs> wanted to show my son who's the boss. I say that proves the case. Yeah, I didn't know that story. He's one of the examples I usually cite, you know, for a manager coming out to take him out to do a pitch count. 
I was talking to one when I was researching the book. I was talking to one of the former uh, national senators uh, who was a rookie that year. I can't right now. I can't think of his name, but it doesn't. And he said, he, you know, the, the the major league pitchers used to pitch batting practice. So Wynn was on the mound, and here he came up, and he was a raw rookie hoping to make the club, and he hit a ball right through <laughs> through Wynn's legs between his legs and Wynn came after he thought he was going to be killed <laughs> so Wynn was this was just you know spring training Brack and he thought Wynn was just going to kill him did anybody mention the Zidane who oh, had his no. great career going and got hit by a wide driver off the bat of Earl Avril in the 37 All-Star game he came back too soon. He broke a towel. Came back too soon and ruined his, uh, you know, delivery. And you know, went to, his career went downhill very quickly after that. Yeah. You know, the one the, days when you had to come back, there wasn't any long-term dis- no. disabled list or. No, no, I, I R or whatever, the injured reserve, whatever. But you know, the one guy that I think is really, uh, we we could talk about in so many different ways about injuries and coming back, um, was Mantle, who in his rookie year twisted his, you know, in the World Series there, uh, in a, in a drain hole out in, in, in he was playing right field then because Dimaggio was still in center, and uh, apparently for the rest of his career he had to tape up his whole leg. Um, and supposedly he was even faster before the accident. I don't know for a fact, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that, that was his good leg because the other leg he had, osteomyelitis, uh, which he, he acquired by getting kicked there during a high school football game. Yeah, he came and, up fast as hell already have been being hurt. Yeah, and he was yeah. called a communist because... He asked me about, he went under what about half a dozen uh, uh, you know times for, for for the army, and they right. rejected him every time because of the osteomyelitis. And he had idiot fans that would call him a communist. You know why can't you fight in uh, Korea? Blah 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 blah. Yeah. Hey guys, I want to talk about someone whose birthday it would have been today. Casey. Casey. Thank- Oh. Casey Stengel. In 1960, he was 70, and they um, gave him an exit, and he said, I'll never make the mistake of being 70 again. <laughs> so um, anybody, let's go around the room, memories of Casey that you'd like to share. How Bach? Well, <laughs> I had lunch the other day with a man named Matt Winnick, who worked for the Mets during the Casey Stengel years. Matt later worked for the National Basketball Association for many years, and he's a good friend, and we had lunch. And he was telling me a story about uh, Casey during his uh, first or second year as manager of the Mets. And the team was on the West Coast, and they had a day off. And uh, Casey decided to host a luncheon at his home in uh, Glendale. And so he picked up uh, picked up two writers, Barney Kremenko and Dick Young, uh, and they were going to go out to his home. And Kremenko and Young ran into the back seat. And Matt Winnick, who was a kid at the time, wasn't quite sure what that was all about. But they, they jumped in the back seat. Matt went into the front seat. And Casey was driving. And Matt Winnick said to me, he drove the way he talked. He would look <laughs> over his shoulder and talk to the guys in the back seat while wow. he was driving the car. I was terrified. But I could just imagine that, that picture. Uh, Casey was one of a kind, you know. And, and I think I told this story once before. We were in L.A. for the winter baseball meetings, and, and uh, the Yankees and Mets took out the writers for dinner. And it was a huge table. I mean, we had we must have had 30 people at this table between the club officials and the writers. And Casey was invited to come because he was in L.A. He's retired at this time. And uh, he was sitting across from the great Joe Reichler, who was a baseball writer for the AP for many years, and at that time was working in the commissioner's office. 
And Reichler, who knew Casey very well, set him up. And he said to Casey, Case, tell them the story about the Southpaw. That's all he said. And now Stengel went off. And he started rambling. And I'm thinking to myself, and I was a kid at the time. If you can believe this, I was once a kid. Mm-hmm. Uh, Casey's rambling and on and on and this and that and the other thing. And I'm thinking to myself, my God, he's melting down right before <laughs> my very eyes. One of the greatest managers, one of the greatest uh, icons in the game of baseball is having a meltdown. And he's going on and on. He must have talked for five minutes. And then he turned to Reichler and he said to him, and that's the left-hander you asked me about. So it was all a setup. (laughs) (laughs) And I couldn't believe my ears. So he was one of a kind. I mean, you'll never see another one like that, I don't think. Not in today's game. I uh, destined to think how the Mets would have fared had they hired in the first year, maybe an Alvin Dark or just anyone else, it just wouldn't have been the same. It would the the whole amazings and, and all of that, the legacy. Uh, I don't think well, they keep would in mind have they had a bad roster. Yeah, but I mean, they hired him more at, more for the attraction that he was yes, coming yes, from did. the Yankees. Um, the, Alvin Dock wouldn't have drawn flies over no, there, you right. know. But also, he they had a bad in, roster. They, the, they drafted all set the washed-up players. Up. Yeah. I'm sorry. They, they, they drafted washed-up players, and they paid the price. There, there's a great story I read, and I posted it on uh, a Facebook site uh, today for his birthday, that uh, they had gotten Gene Woodling from uh, the Washington Senators in 1962. And the Wood- Woodling had several very good years for the Yankees, had one bad year, and was sent to Baltimore in the uh, Turley Lawson trade. And uh, Stengel said that was the worst trade that the Yankees made when he was there. Because Woodling went out to have several very good years. So anyway, Woodling is sitting next to Stengel in the dugout, watching the 62 bats blow another game. And he turns to Woodling and said, it ain't like the old days, is it? And it wasn't. Yeah, but he was, to me, outside of the you know, couple of mistakes he made in the 1960 World Series, was the greatest manager ever. You know, Ralph, he, uh, another person I got to speak to f- for the book was, Casey, uh, I think she was his grandniece, and she was she lives out in the Arizona area somewhere, um, and she was sort of the keeper of Stengel's you know, memory and mementos and all this other stuff. And I know she was in the process of uh, turning a script into a movie. I've never seen anything about it. But she would make a great guest, you know. I'm thinking of, like, Isla, who was such a good guest that we had. Um, right. if you could If you could track her down, uh, because she gave me some really interesting stuff uh, for Stengel, about Stengel for the book. And things that you know maybe only the sports writers knew. Nothing you know risque. What's but her last interesting. name, David? I'll I tell you I will f- try to find it. I'm sure it's in the in the thank you credits, you know, in the book. But I don't have it in front of me. The, the other great story is uh, I think it was 1958. Uh, they were having a hearing in Washington about baseball's baseball's exemption from the antitrust laws. So they called a whole bunch of people in, and they called Stengel in one day, and he started rambling, and he was giving his whole life from uh, his first stop at the Miners in 1910 in Kankakee, Illinois, and he went on for about 20 minutes. Uh, they, of course, it was all Stengelies, and, uh, and uh, right after that, they had Mantle. And yeah, said, Mantle cracked up. He was laughing Mantle, 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 Mantle said, my views are just the same as Casey's. Yeah, and yeah. Anyway, he was sitting there laughing hysterically yeah. while Stengel yeah. was going on. <laughs> yeah. I would have loved to hear a, uh, you know, a, uh, to see a uh, clubhouse meeting between Stengel, Yogi, Phil Rizzuto, and Jerry Coleman. Oh, wow. <laughs> and um, I want to get George Casey's uh, uh 
did your dad have any experiences with Casey George? Well, I don't, I don't think he did, Ralph. But you know, Casey Stengel, obviously, as you guys were talking, I mean, he was legendary, and and the fact is, he had those great, great Yankees teams, you know, during the fifties. But the one story I remember, I think somebody saw a, a photo or something of uh, of Stengel when he, I believe, he was playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And I think it was one of his players said, my God, is that you, Casey? And Casey said something about, well, I haven't always been old. <laughs> Didn't he but, let him burn out under such, his cap one time? Yeah, I mean, yeah. He, was such a, he was such a great manager. But, you know, as your guys are talking about the Stengelisms, I mean, that was what he did. And, you know, you with know, the Yankees... You know, he didn't have to really talk that much with the Yankees because the players could do the talking for him. But when he got to the Mets, I mean, he had to be the attraction there because they didn't have the talent. One of the uh, things when he broke in in 1912 with the Dodgers, he won four for four in his first game. He said, and he said they thought I was another Ty Cobb. It took me a week to prove I wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I once interviewed the great Warren Spahn. Uh, who, in my mind, I think we talked about this last week, uh, here's a guy who fought the Battle of the Bulge and came right. home and, and won 363 games, more than any left-handed pitcher in history. I interviewed him when he was with the Mets. He, at the end of his career, he, he was a pitching coach and part-time pitcher with the Mets. And, of course, the Met, that Met team was awful, as, as Alan will tell you, and, and so will Ralph. And... Uh, I asked him about Casey, and he said, you know, he had played uh, for Casey in Boston just before he went off to fight in the war, 1942, 41, somewhere in there. He said, you know, I played for him before he was a genius, and I played for him after he was a genius, (laughs) meaning he missed the Yankee years. (laughs) Casey always admitted that he uh, was wrong about Spahn. Because he didn't oh, yeah. like him when he, he was with the Boston Braves for that short time. He didn't like him. And they, Stengel said, boy, I blow that one. He won 365 games. 363. He didn't win the first one until he was 26 years old yeah. because of the war. Um, Another great Stengel, performance. Stengel, yes. Stengel quote was when uh, Brooks Robinson asked Casey if he was the best third baseman defensively that uh, he ever saw. He says, you're number two. And he, he, he says, who's number one? He says, number three in Brooklyn. He says, he, he wasn't a third baseman. He was an acrobat. Of course, he used some, you know, uh, some profanity to emphasize, uh, you know, the Cox. acrobat. Yeah. At the, number three was Billy Cox. You know, in, uh, in in talking about Casey Stengel, one thing that just came to mind, I believe he was a dentist. He went to dental um, school. He never went to dental school and said, yeah, well, he gave up dental it, yeah. school because, you know, yeah, they, didn't yeah. make, they didn't make dental instruments for left-handers. So. Wow. That's one of his great quotes was in 1952. There's a book out that I have, The Gospel According to Casey, which has a million quotes of his, the, when they were in that very tight race in 1952, with the Indians, uh, a fellow uh, was having his worst year, and Al Lopez said, there's a basically pitch, win Lemon and Garcia, until their arms fell off. So he asked Stengel about that, he said, sometimes it don't always work. <laughs> he, mangled, he, mangled the, he mangled the English language as much as Yogi did. And I think Probably the three. The, the How three, much of Yogi was Joe Garagiola? Yeah. Um, uh, either of you guys, Yankee fans, David Hubler or Al Blumkin, um, was Yogi more of a creation? No, he just said things. Yogi was not a comic. He said things funny. Yeah, I mean, he, he was just that was his natural. He, yeah, he didn't say funny things. He said things funny. Right, that's a good way of putting it. I'm very basically, good. I, I can't take credit for that. Well, but, go uh, ahead. <laughs> basically, uh, basically uh, the three most quoted baseball figures in the 20th century were Casey, Yogi, and Satchel Page. 
That's tr- I would agree with that. Yeah. Have to throw one branch, Ricky, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. He's he's got uh, the one, my favorite one is addition by subtraction. You trade a guy. Just getting rid of him is an addition. So. There's another story where Casey was with the Mets in spring training, and there were two players that he was looking at. He says, see those two guys? He says, one of them has a chance. They're both 20 years old. One of them has a chance to be a star. The other one has a chance to be 30. (laughs) (laughs) Are you just full of these things? And this book, if you can get hold of it, it's called The Gospel According to Casey. It's a large paperback. Not very expensive. It has everything, everything attributed to him. And that's where I got most of my stuff from. All right. Hey guys, great show. Thank you, the four of you. It's a pleasure meeting up like this, talking ball. My favorite thing. My well, maybe my second favorite thing to do in, in the whole world. Um, thank you guys. It's a pleasure. Okay, we'll speak to you next week then, I guess. Next week, David Hubler, Hal Bach, George Case III, and Alan Blumkin. I'm Ralph Tycho, the weak link of it all, comfortably zoned radio, talking ball in the zone. Thanks again, guys. Yep, great to be with everybody. Good night.